Hi class, today we'll look at chapter 7, Social Class Structure and Equality. The title itself suggesting a uh, heavy emphasis from conflict theory. Uh, think about what it means to be rich uh, and poor to you. We tend to have these drastic ideas, you know, uh, a dichotomy of poor and rich, but when it comes to social class, it tends to be so subject subjective, it's so hard to really determine where poverty starts, where middle class uh, blurs. So think about it. What is your own definition of social class? The chapter's major focus is definitely social stratification. So if you think about society as a pyramid where people are in different tiers depending on their social class. So for example, thinking about a pyramid-shaped society where the rich are on top and the underclass or working uh, poor are at the very bottom. That can be a very good visual for us to really consider uh, the significance of social class. How does it play a role in our lives? How are we viewed as people? You know, um, there have been social experiments. If you think about this, if you see somebody out there in the street, they're lying on the floor. Um, maybe they look injured. If you see this person, scenario A, this person's well dressed, uh, laying on the floor, and then you see this other person, scenario B. This person's not well dressed, raggedy clothing. You know, who are we more likely to consider assisting? Who are we more likely uh, to not help out? So, unfortunately, um, social stratification plays a big role in our um, concepts of deserving and uh, who's worth it. Social inequality, definitely. Um, not sure how you feel about this uh, topic, but some people might be pissed off about it, but the truth is that there's inevitable social inequality in the United States. Statistics show that there has been an increase in inequality, and um, definitely uh, statistics show this, and I'll show you a few videos. Uh, so major uh, points here, um, social stratification, here you go, there's your visual. You can think about it as a cake, you can think about it as a pyramid, so just think about it. This process of uh, ranking people in terms of worth. Of course, it can be grouping based on other matters such as race, you know, social, class, gender, sexual orientation. If you think about things in the sense think about heterosexuality, where does heterosexuality fall in the pyramid? Obviously, heterosexuality would be the dominant group in our society, so they would be at the top, and uh, LGBT folks would be definitely at the bottom. Um, think about people with disabilities. People that are quote-unquote able-bodied would be at the top. People with conditions, disabilities would definitely be at the bottom. So we'll continue to talk about this as the weeks go by. So social stratification plays a huge role. Uh, if it helps you at all to consider it, Stratification occurs in all human societies, so it's not really a cool thing if you think about it, looking at people's worth, quote-unquote, but it happens in all societies. There are some societies that may, for example, see um, um, Christianity at the bottom, well, maybe Islam at the top, or think about... Um, matriarchal societies, they might have men at the bottom and women on top of the ladder. So really, they all have different arrangements. It depends on what society we're discussing. So uh, this chapter really helps you understand inequalities in places that you might have not seen before. So perhaps you uh, never really considered how social class may impact somebody's life experience. Um, how do positions of social hierarchies tend to shape the lives of individuals, you know? H access to health care, the criminal justice system, as we saw in the documentary 13th, employment opportunities, all these things are really connected to social class. It's not, you know, independent. Also, consider your own place in these social arrangements and how your access, uh, your chances and access have been affected by your position. So sometimes we're um, oblivious to reality, uh, and in the U.S. we tend to see ourselves as middle class. I mean, definitely our uh, belief, our ideology is that, you know, meritocracy, basically working hard, um, 
doing our best will lead us to a good life. But when we see these unequal chances or lack of opportunities, it tends to be contradictory, right? It's really hard to to really picture inequality and meritocracy in one society, but that's basically, you know, the experience we have. And of course, a knowledge of stratification can help you uh, play a role in changing systems of inequality. So talking about sociology, all is, this is always very uh, pessimistic, but if you think about it in an objective way, there's so much that we can do, so much good that we can do within our own fields of study, within our own experiences. Uh, moving on, so social inequality. In this uh, image and in this chapter, we look at social inequality in terms of uh, income, in terms of an equal distribution of wealth, power, prestige among members of a society. So let's check this uh, clip out. Let me see. Uh, Robert Reich is an economist at UC Berkeley. He teaches um, over there, and this is what he has to say. The recent past has seen greater economic inequality in America than at any time since the Great Depression. In the three decades after World War II, American incomes grew quickly and equally. But starting in the late 1970s, things began to change. Today, 1% of Americans are taking home nearly 20% of the country's total income and own more than 35% of America's wealth. And it didn't happen by accident. It's the result of policy decisions on taxes, education, trade, labor, macroeconomics, and financial regulation, all of which shifted economic power away from low and moderate income American families. Economic inequality is real, it's personal, it's expensive, and it was created. Since the 1960s, tax rates on very high incomes have been slashed dramatically starving public investments in schools, roads, and everything else needed to build our economy, and providing ever greater incentives to rig the economy's rules to send more money to the top. The laws we've created to govern globalization have protected corporate interests, but done nothing for American workers. Instead, we've allowed workers' rights to be systematically dismantled, both here and abroad. Policymakers also began using high unemployment, which hurts everybody, but especially low and middle wage workers, to protect the wealthy from any hint of inflation. And then corporate interests pushed to abandon safeguards preventing the financial sector from making risky bets, which had to be backstopped by American taxpayers when those bets went sour, a protection not given America's underwater homeowners. All of this created the worst economic crisis since the 1930s. And we did it by allowing those with the most economic power to set the rules of our economy. It's continuing today. By the end of 2012, American workers' share of the economic pie was the lowest in more than half a century, while the share going to corporate profits was the highest on record. This isn't sustainable. We can't have a prosperous economy without a large and growing middle class. None of this happened by accident. We allowed it to happen, but it can be fixed. So let's fix it. So think about the message of this, um video you know what is your perspective how do you feel about that so just uh briefly talking about systems of stratification as the book mentions of course the most drastic one is that we all know slavery so the ownership of individuals even though this is uh illegal it still continues to exist in different forms think about sex trafficking um 13th discusses uh the criminal justice system mass incarceration in the u.s all those are examples of slavery um yes uh india for example the caste system based on heredity heredity basically think about uh people being born in different social uh tears and having no way of moving out of there connected to karma for example if you're born at the top you had a good life you were a good person in the past uh, life so therefore you deserve being at the top if maybe you were in a terrible person or something therefore you're at the bottom and you deserve it so think about how people might internalize this that's how their system works um people cannot marry outside of their um tier the one they belong to um 
of course, uh, the book also mentions apartheid, South Africa, based on race and uh, background. And of course, our very own social class system in the U.S., as many Western societies, uh, basically looking at how um, one can move up or down the social ladder based on characteristics such as merit, talent, ability, or performance, um, wealth, pow property, power, prestige. So going back to meritocracy, the idea that, that if you work hard, you're able to make it, uh, and if you don't, you, do, you, you don't make it. Uh, another word for social class, socioeconomic status. I really like this visual because it pretty much places people in different uh, areas, different uh, heights based on how much money they possess. And it sounds a little cynical, but think about how much of this is true in our society. Uh, I'll be talking about our reflection sometime. Uh, today I introduce once again this concept of intersectionality, the idea that our lived experience really is connected to different uh, social identity aspects of our uh, life. So for example, matters like social class, race, uh, gender, sexuality, uh, religion, uh, nationality, those things definitely do impact how we perceive life. So not one thing will impact our life, it's a connection of these. So today we talk about social class. I would like you to consider, you know, how social class has impacted your life experience. Skipping these classifications, I would like to go directly into the um, the images. So right here, on your right, you definitely see our most recent uh, uh, social class ladder from the book, most recent edition. As you see, the upper class 1%, the so-called 1%ers. Uh, upper class 14%, middle class you see 30% of the population, lower working class 30%, working class, working poor making 13% of population, and the underclass 12. If you compare this uh, scale on the right to the one on the left, the one on the left is from the previous book um, edition, there is a drastic change. So from the previous edition to this current one, the underclass has grown 7%. So going from 5% to 12%, what does this tell us? That uh, poverty in the U.S. has increased. So that's something to really, really uh, be aware of, to be concerned of. So here this tells us the percent of the population that falls within that social class. Uh, the typical household incomes of that social classification, occupations, and education, for example. And of course, if it doesn't seem like it makes any sense, uh, keep in mind how things aren't set. It's quite subjective. So the concept of status and consistency really makes us understand how so for uh, celebrities, for example, you might have people that have no education, but they have a lot of money. Or think about people that might be educated and they might not have any prestige. So um, this is an example of status and consistency. Mother Teresa, for example, she was uh, very poor, yet she was very prestigious, very well known. So this can operate like that. So it's not always about money or about education. Um, we'll watch this shortly. <laughs> 